Uh, I'm going to talk a bit about a survey that we ran last year in November and early December to engage the community on water management in the upper Murrumbidgee River. And while I'm presenting this, I do want to acknowledge the team members at the Australian River Restoration Centre who really made this survey come together because it was a unique piece of work uh, that has, I think, produced a, a really handy product for us all to use. The thing about this survey is we asked both qualitative and quantitative questions. So we got some really great stories and quotes from across the catchment from different community members who have a really strong connection and interest uh, to the not just the Upper Murrumbidgee River, but all the rivers of the catchment, uh, Malonglo, Queenbean, Cotter, etc. You know, a real strong connection across the, the catchment. So to gain these insights about the survey, we broadly broke our survey up into four key themes because it wasn't just trying to get one way input. It was about getting feedback from the community. It was about educating the community on some of the water management issues in the region. It was about getting people's opinions on how it's managed at the moment. And it's about getting people's desires to what they want to see in the future management uh, of this part of the Murray-Darling Basin. So as I said, it ran for just over a month. We had over a thousand responses, which we were really pleased uh, to, to get. And that mix of qualitative and quantitative gave us some really rich uh, numerical data, as well as some great stories and quotes and anecdotes along the way as well. So I've pinched a couple of slides from a presentation I gave about two years ago uh, on the Upper Murrumbidgee River. And I do, this is the a schematic map of the Southern Murray-Darling Basin. And emphasising that we are talking about this upper part of the uh, uh, upper, the upper part of the Southern Murray Darling Basin, because this is where we have this interaction between federal water reforms, Snowy Hydro legislation, and New South Wales water legislation. It's an interaction between three legislative environments that makes the operation of this part of the Southern Murray Darling Basin different to other parts. Now, this was a slide that I prepared for that presentation, and some of you may have seen this before, but it is just to you know illustrate this interaction that's happening in the Upper Murrumbidgee between New South Wales Water Management Act, the Snowy Corporatisation Act, and the Commonwealth Water Act. And while the Commonwealth Water Act and the Murray Darling Basin Plan and the plans that sit underneath it are designed to improve the balance of how we manage water across our catchments. The Water Act itself still defers, it ensures that this cannot be inconsistent with this environment here, this snowy hydro operating environment, which I'm broadly focusing on three key parts. The snowy water license that they operate under, which is their license to uh, manage the water. The snowy water inquiry outcomes implementation deed. So that's an, inter bear with me on that one. It's really important. It's a really weirdly named document to communicate about, but it's a really important document struck between the Commonwealth, New South Wales and Victorian governments that came out of the Snowy Water Inquiry in the late 1990s to try and return water to the environment. And finally, and of high relevance to this converse, conversation at the moment, is the Snowy Hydro Limited Statement of Expectations. Now that's the expectations that the shareholders set on Snowy Hydro about how to run the business. Now, the two shareholders at the moment are the Commonwealth Minister for Finance, our own ACT Senator Katie Gallagher, and the Commonwealth Minister for Energy, Chris Bowen. They're the two shareholders that give the, set the expectations for how the company runs on behalf of the Australian community. What's interesting, those two portfolios, finance and energy, doesn't bring in environment or water at all. And so it's not surprising that this document in its current form focuses on power generation, revenue, Snowy 2.0, and, and nothing, not my, nothing else in terms of social, cultural, environmental, critical human water needs, a whole range of things that the community told us through the survey that they value. So in those four key areas that are sort of highlighted area, the first thing we did is we asked people about their relationships to the river. And you can see from the survey responses that a lot of the, re the responses we did receive were from people who live or work along the river uh, or in the broader Upper Murrumbidgee catchment. But as mentioned, you know, we did get some responses broader, some downstream of Burrunjuk Dam, which is great, 
across the other parts of the Murray-Darling Basin and outside the basin. So people with a connection that felt strongly enough to still do the survey outside the, the catchment. We found that people had a really strong connections for a whole range of reasons, cultural, social, economic, ecological, uh, recreational, a whole range of values that people felt really strongly connected uh, to, to the river and the rivers of the region. Now, the second part of the survey I mentioned is that we were trying to also raise awareness. So in the way that we structured some of the questions, we would ask a question, get a response, and then we'd have a follow up prompt to let people know about the results. So for this first one, is the Upper Murrumbidgee part of the Murray-Darling Basin? Yeah, we found about, you know, four in five people recognise that it is part of the basin. But once they'd answered this question afterwards, we had a follow up prompt to say, yes, it is part of the basin. So it was an educational survey not just a one-way information um, gathering process. But you can also see, you know, of a thousand responses, you know, again, sort of that four in five were aware that Canberra was the largest city, is the largest city in the basin, but one in five people sort of still didn't, weren't aware that Canberra is the largest city in the Murray-Darling Basin. Um, we asked the community about, did they understand that it's a source of critical human water needs for the region? And again, most people recognise that. But still, that's sort of one in five recognising or not aware or unsure of whether the Upper Murrumbidgee is a source of our critical human water needs. And then we did ask about water management as well. So were people aware that that interaction between Commonwealth, state and snowy hydro legislation had meant that the Murray-Darling Basin had had little impact in improving the health of the river in the region? A good thing about all this information is it's all in the report and online and available. So I'll share that link at the end so you don't need to memorize it or write it all down now. One of the key questions we asked is how much of the headwater flows of the Upper Murrumbidgee is captured by Tantangra Dam and diverted for the purpose of hydropower? And this is the one where, you know, 30% of people knew that it's more than 90%, but you can see that quite a, you know, over two thirds of people were not aware that the, the level of capture of the headwaters of this river. And this is one of the strongest points where we received a lot of feedback on where everybody said over 90% is not sustainable. So of all the questions and answers that we asked and in the comments and in follow up you know, queries we had with people, this idea that over 90 to 99% of the river being regulated and then used as part of hydropower was seen as unsustainable. Um, so that's a really key takeaway from the survey. We asked people their opinions, so we grabbed a few of their views on water management, and this is just one that I've selected for this. There's a few more in the actual report. Do you agree that the Murray-Darling Basin Plan has helped improve the health of the Upper Murrumbidgee River? And you can see quite a mixed uh, range of views. Quite a strong in the disagree to strongly disagree. Uh, I think it's about two in five. A few in the unsure category. So some people did the survey. were learning about the Upper Murrumbidgee for the first time. So it's not surprising we had some unsure people in areas. You know, a fair proportion in the neither agree or disagree. And then there are, you know, quite a few sort of one in five, I think, who said agree to strongly agree. Now, reflecting on the survey, the question I wish I would asked as a follow up is if you've selected agree or if you selected agree, strongly agree, disagree or strongly disagree, what made you choose your answer? I wish we'd asked that question to try and unpack that response there a bit more and that response there a bit more. Now, the next part uh, we asked was about people's desires for its future management. And this is coming back to this comes back to that document I mentioned earlier, that statement of expectations. What's the What does the community expect to be considered in the management of our river? At the moment, that statement of expectations is power generation and revenue only. So we asked, what do you think needs to be considered? And we got really quite a strong response that people would like to see water quality, environmental sustainability, transparency of operations, critical human water needs, community, engagement, cultural outcomes um, considered as part of the river's management. Now, while there's a really sort of strong response in these columns here, I do also want to acknowledge that off to the right here 
yet it's, people still agree that these need to be considered in the management of the river. So I don't want to discount agricultural use or production, uh, recreational use and regional development. They need to be considered in the management of this river. So this is a really handy graph that's come out of the survey that I'd really encourage people to pick up and use if you're doing submissions, if you're communicating to politicians about what does the community want to see factored into the management of this river? Well, they've they've told us. And, and the Murray-Darling Basin Plan and the National Water Initiative are trying to do a lot of this already. So it's just making it consistent with those reforms. Now, in the desires, we, as I said, we asked sort of the questions and then we also asked for comments and people, this is a chance where people gave us just their free text of what they wanted to see considered in its management better health for the environment, better access and you know, cleanliness for recreational use, better you know, cultural outcomes and, and outcomes for First Nations people, environmental sustainability, critical human water needs. This was the chance for people to have their say. Um, and there's a lot of great quotes that you can draw from this report from this in this regard. This is just some more of them. It's, it's over two pages. Um, I won't talk too much about this. I'll just let you sort of read through them. But it's those sort of key themes. I guess the the overarching message out of this is 90 to 99 percent of diversion is too much. You cannot get a balance for a healthy river or a, a river that services the multiple needs that the community want to be able to use the river for and allow that level of take. So now once the survey, the second part now is the survey has been undertaken, we've got the report. Where is it going to be used next? Well, we're really pleased that the ACT Water Minister and the ACT Government have really sort of backed the outcomes of this survey. And so here's just the launch of the survey results by Water Minister Shane Rattenbury uh, in March this year. Uh, he does have a statement on his website, which again is another resource that I encourage people to draw on if you're communicating to councils, uh, politicians to say, yeah, you know, the ACT government is behind this. And then I've also highlighted this neat little article here from the Canberra Daily, which said the Upper Murrumbidgee River has found its voice, which is a really nice article and it's not behind a paywall. So I do encourage you to go and have a bit of a look at that. And we can probably share the links after this presentation, I'd say. But the important thing out of this is how is this information being used? Firstly, it's got the backing of the ACT government. So the ACT Office of Water have really um, appreciated the outcomes of this survey and are using it in some of those basin plan processes that they have to participate in. The second aspect that's happened is this report has been presented to the ACT and Region Catchment Coordination Group. Now that group includes the count three councils, New South Wales councils, Yass Valley, Queenbie and Palarang and Snowy Monero. Uh, as well as ACT, New South Wales governments, community, First Nations. So that group has now got that this report and is also backing it and hearing the voice of the community to again help inform change in the Upper Murrumbidgee. I guess our biggest risk at the moment, uh, I actually put this in a second time to say this, the biggest risk at the moment is this voice here, this slide which shows the community voice of what they want to see as part of management of this river gets lost in the next step of updating that statement of expectations from shareholders. Um, and that's this document down the bottom here. Now this document is being reviewed at the moment. And as I said, to date, it's been finance and energy that have done it and not surprising, a lot of those values are not considered. They are making connections with the Commonwealth water portfolio, which is great but we've really struggled to get community engagement on this. So we've approached uh, the finance minister several times to say, how can the community inform this? Because this sets the direction for the Snowy Hydro Board for the management of this river. And my real concern is that these are gonna get missed. If they don't listen to the community or if they're not even coming to ask the community as part of that review, that these will get missed. So my takeaway from this is if, if you're looking for next steps, so what do we do with this information now? I'll show you in a moment where the report is on the website, but I encourage you, this is purely political from this point on. It requires political engagement with our senators, with our uh, ACT government, with our ACT members of parliament, federal parliament. This 
this requires a political engagement process. So I really encourage you, please use the survey. Uh, please go and look at the current statement of expectations. It's only three pages. It's on the Forgotten River website and you'll get a sense of just how they set this out. But this will really set the direction for Snowy Hydro over the next, I'd imagine, three to five years. Um, finally, just as I wrap up, uh, you're asking where is all this information? If you go to the Forgotten River website, we've added this new tab up the top here. Uh, called Community Voice. And under that tab, you can see the full results of the survey, uh, including the original PDF report. And the, the cool thing about this is you can just send this link to anyone and they can jump in and have a look. It's all there, all the quotes that were pro provided, all the results. So really strongly encourage you to go and look at this. And just quickly, before I did jump on, I did bring up the Statement of Expectations, which is on the Forgotten River website which you can go and have a, a look at. Now that community engagement does relate to construction activities. So, um, and that, this was written by the previous government. So I'll stop there, I'll stop sharing uh, and open the floor for questions. Mm -hmm.